almost unimaginable 800,000 British soldiers, sailors and airmen died in the Great War. And you can add to that almost 300,000 soldiers from the Empire. Most of them lie in very large military cemeteries like this one out on the battlefields of the Ypres salient in Belgium just across the channel. And of course others have their names commemorated on some very large memorials to the missing. This is the Menin Gate in Ypres where no less than 53,000 men are commemorated. They have no known grave and their bodies are lost out on the battlefield. There are also World War I soldiers buried here in our county of Dorset. Many of them would have been brought home from the Western Front, badly wounded for treatment and for recuperation. Sadly, some of them never recovered. There are also men buried here who died of perfectly natural causes. And then there are those who are killed during the very dangerous military training that soldiers had to undertake. There are 662 British servicemen buried in Dorset in 376 separate churchyards or town cemeteries across the county. There's one in Bournemouth and others in villages that have become part of that town since 1918. To see if there's a grave of a First World War soldier near you, visit the Commonwealth War Graves Commission website. Some cemeteries have just a single grave, while others have almost 70. Soldiers who died during the First World War have special gravestones that were put up and are maintained by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. So Felicity, you're bringing me to a specific grave here in Wareham Cemetery. Yes, um, this is the grave of 2nd Lieutenant Tattersfield, who was a member of the Tank Corps. And I see that he's got the standard Commonwealth War Graves Commission headstone found worldwide. And what's more, it's made of our very own Portland stone. It is indeed, and they were given a standard format. So you've got his regimental badge at the top, his rank, his name, his regiment here, the date that he died, and the age that he was when he died. We've also got a religious symbol. So in this case, um, it's a cross because he was a Christian. Over there, we have a grave without a religious symbol. So he would have been a non-believer or agnostic? Yes. Are there any other religious symbols? You might, for example, find a Star of David if he was Jewish. Underneath, there was a space for the family to pay to have a personal message put on the stone as well. For freedom's course, he left his home and native land far across the sea. Firstly, I've just noticed that he died just days after the end of the war in 1918. What happened to him? Well, Neville was injured in the Battle of Amiens in August 1918, and he was brought back to Britain to recuperate. Unfortunately, while he was here, he contracted pneumonia and, as you say, died very shortly after the armistice. Very sad. Mm. Most of these Australian soldiers were wounded out on the Western Front and brought back here for treatment, particularly in hospitals in the southern part of the county. But as you can see, quite a number died of their wounds. A hundred years ago, of course, it was not a practical proposition to send them back to Australia halfway round the other side of the world. Consequently, they lie here amongst us in for what for them is the corner of a foreign field.
Most of the soldiers who fell during the war were buried in cemeteries out on the battlefields, in places that it was often impossible for family members to visit. Because of this, war memorials were erected in virtually every town and village across Dorset. Some are expensive and elaborate, like this one at Ewan Minster, while others are far simpler. But however simple or elaborate, they all commemorate the thousands of men from our county who gave their lives in fighting for the freedom that we enjoy today. When memorials like this one were first put up in the aftermath of the First World War, normally around 1920, their role was quite different. They were there to act very much as a focus of remembrance for family and friends who had lost a loved one and whose grave was invariably far too far away to mourn over. But today their role is significantly different. They stand in our towns and villages across the county to remind us of the sacrifice made by virtually every community, whether large or small, in this most terrible of world wars. Art is another form of memorial that we find in the county. This picture was painted by the famous war artist Lady Butler. It shows the charge of the Dorset Yeomanry Cavalry against Turkish machine guns and Sanusi tribesmen in a remote part of Egypt's deserts. Dorset Yeomen were killed during the charge and they were buried in a mass grave that has now been lost in the desert. We've come into the education room within the Tank Museum complex so Felicity, how can children find out more about a First World War soldier? Well, a great starting point for a project in the classroom is for um, children to either find a name on a local war memorial or use their own family name and you can use sites like the Commonwealth War Graves Commission which has a simple search facility to find out more about those soldiers. If you want to go into more depth you can look at sites like Ancestry and Find My Pass. You can come here to the museum to use Find My Past. We actually offer a research skills workshop for visiting school groups where we can help your children develop their research skills using First World War soldiers as a starting point. So they would use these computers to find out, say, more about a name of a man or a woman on the war memorial in their town or village. Absolutely. In this short film, we have looked at the ways in which soldiers, sailors and airmen who lost their lives during the First World War are commemorated. Their graves and their memorials across Dorset serve to remind us that we should honour those who left their homes to fight an aggressive enemy and made the ultimate sacrifice to ensure that the British way of life would endure.